Hello, in this lecture, we're going to talk about the contribution margin income statement. At the end of this, we will be able to create a contribution margin income statement from a trial balance, create income statement from a trial balance, a financial income statement, uh, compare and contrast the contribution margin income statement to a standard financial income statement, and calculate the contribution margin per unit. Okay, so we're going to have the trial balance over here on the left-hand side. We're going to start off with a normal financial uh, income statement. Reason being is because we want to compare and contrast the two. So I want to start off with what we know, then move on to the new thing, the contribution margin income statement. On the left-hand side, we have a trial balance, which has a very limited balance sheet portion, which only has the cash and the accounts uh, payable and retained earnings. Everything else is related to the income statement. So we have revenue on down all the expenses related to the income statement. Net income is 72,270. That's going to be the revenue minus the expenses. So we already know what the bottom line number of the income statement will be. That's going to be same, the same for the normal income statement as well as the contribution margin income statement. The thing that will differ is the categorization. The normal income statement is going to categorize by, by what the expense is for. The contribution income statement is going to categorize by the type of expense, the behavior of the expense, variable versus fixed. And there's different reasons for the two of those. Remember that the, that the income statement financial side, that's what's going to be due for generally accepted accounting principles. That's what external users want to see in terms of the big picture. When we think about contribution margin income statement, we're usually thinking about internal use, managerial accounting, internal use, because it really helps to make projections and things like that. Also note that I'm going to basically have the expense for direct materials, direct wages, and like factory overhead type stuff. So we're expensing it in real time as it, as it happens. And the assumption being that basically we're taking the job and, and we're expensing it and selling it at the same time. That's why these are going to be included in cost of goods sold rather than we, what we would kind of do in a job cost system, which is basically uh, put it in the work and process, then finished goods, and then uh, expense it when it's sold at a later time. And the reason for that is because I want to group out what's in the cost of goods sold by what's in there so that we can kind of see what's making up the cost to get sold, which is going to be the direct materials, the wages, and the, and the overhead, as compared to the contribution margin income statement, which isn't going to be grouping in the same way. So let's find a home for all these. We're going to say the revenue is a credit here. We're going to put it on the statement as just a positive number. Then we're going to calculate the cost of goods sold. Normally, it would be always calculated as beginning inventory plus uh, purchases, or in this case, um, cost of goods manufactured minus the ending inventory. But here, remember, we expensed everything because we're kind of assuming that we uh, did it at the same time, meaning we um, did the work and then sold it in the same time period. And therefore, we're going to put the components of what makes up cost of goods sold. Remember, cost of goods sold is the inventory we're selling. That is made up in one way or the other by the direct materials. Direct materials and direct uh, wages, that's what's being put into the cost of goods sold, the inventory that we're selling. Notice that those two are generally variable costs, meaning they change in direct proportion to the number of stuff that we're producing. And then we have the overhead, which oftentimes is the fixed cost. So note that uh, the, the behavior of these two costs are going to be different, uh, but we're grouping them not by behavior. We're grouping them by category. In this case, the costs related to the inventory that we're selling. Now, what would be grouped into something like overhead uh, not sales commission, we would have the taxes on the factory, anything that says factory on it. So <laughs> maintenance on the factory, so I'm going to put a dot here. We got the depreciation on the factory, lease of uh, factory equipment. So those are all types of things that would be included or could be included in the overhead. So if we add those up, we'll bring the calculator over here and see if we can add those up. We've got the 13,500 plus the 27,000 plus the, the 87,000 plus the 27. Thousand gives us the uh, 154.5. So there's that 154.5 there, and that will give us the <clears throat> total cost of goods sold. So here's the total cost of goods sold. Once again, we're just showing the components of it: direct materials, direct labor, overhead. We're breaking this out by category. In this case, cost of goods sold. That'll give us the gross profit. The most important number on the financial statement is the comparison of the revenue to the cost of the stuff that we're selling. That's usually the most important comparison. That's what the users of the financial statements really want to see. We break out the other uh, expenses in terms of operating expenses, which would be selling expenses and administrative. Selling expenses in this case uh, consists of sales commission. And notice that sales commission is a variable cost because it's going to change with the number of stuff that we sell. So it behaves more like direct materials and direct wages. 
and uh, and unlike kind of a lot of the stuff in overhead, which is kind of fixed. But we're breaking it out by category, not by behavior of the cost. We have the rent on the office sales, uh, rent on office here. We have uh, then the total selling expenses. We add these two up, so the 95.7 plus 77,000 equals the uh, 172.7. And then we're going to have the administrative expenses. Administrative expenses will include the uh, administrative salaries. So administrative salaries here. That will include the accounting in this case. And then we have the rent on the administrative office, which is the 50 here. Notice we found a home for everything on the income statement, all the dark blue numbers except for the income tax. That's usually be going to be calculated at the end because it's going to depend on the net income. So that's going to give us the total administrative we're breaking these out in this column now, so that'll give us the total operating. So total operating being broke out over here, being this number plus this number, and then we can get the income before taxes, which is the uh, 450, 150 minus uh, the 329.7. That'll give us the 120, 450. Again, we often break out taxes at the end because we're going to calculate the taxes based on that number, and if we put it in somewhere else, it kind of distorts taxes. But we, we broke it out on the trial balance here so we can see it there. And, and problems you're often going to say see someone something say like calculate taxes between a 30 and 40% tax rate on that. I believe there's like 40% tax rate of the 120, uh, 450. And then we could say if we subtract that out, we get the 72, 270. That matches what we have here, 72, 270. Now, remember, this is grouped by category, meaning the cost of the inventory, the operating expenses being selling, and administrative not by the behavior. We've got things that are variable and things that are fixed in most of those categories, as opposed to the contribution margin. So note the contribution margin income statement is going to end up at the same spot. We're going to have the 72, 270. What we want to do, though, is break it out not by category. We want to break it out by behavior of the cost. Why? Because behavior of the cost is something that we could really help with projections, and that's what we'll take a look at in the, in the next when we talk about the contribution margin per unit. But uh, so that's why we're doing it, and we'll take a look at that more later. We're still going to start off with sales, of course. So we're going to take these same numbers, we're going to stick with sales. But instead of having cost of goods sold, we're going to talk about variable costs now. Variable costs by behavior, not by uh, category. So variable costs being the direct materials, the direct labor, and the sales commission. So that's kind of funny that we have you know, stuff that's related to uh, making the inventory and stuff that's related to selling things and not included in the creation of the inventory in the same group. That's funny for financial statement purposes, but it makes perfect sense for projection purposes. So if we add those up, we have the total variable cost of 730800 And then if we take the look at the fix, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> then we get the contribution margin. That's going to be the sales minus the total variable cost. That gives us the contribution margin. So Gross profit being the most important number on the normal financial statements. Contribution num margin being the most important number here uh, because that's going to be the relationship between the sales and the variable costs. And we'll see the contribution margin per unit will also be quite important. So then we have the fixed costs. Fixed costs being the things that will not change with the level of production. And those include the uh, taxes on the factory. We're assuming that's going to be fixed, like sales tax or something like that. On, on the uh, Not sales tax, property tax on the factory. And then we've got the maintenance on the factory. Again, we're assuming that's fixed. We actually said so here. And then we're saying the depreciation and the lease on the factory equipment, as well as the administrative salaries. Notice once again that we're talking about costs that are all over the place here. We're talking about stuff that's included in inventory, would be in cost to get sold, and stuff that's uh, that's in the administrative place here. And then we've got the rent on the admissions administrative office, rent on the sales office. So now we have sales things in this fixed cost category. And then we have the total fixed cost here. Again, we found a home for everything except for the uh, income tax because that's always going to be broken out at the end. And we would come up to the same income before income tax, same number we had last time, that being the contribution margin less the fixed costs. And then we're going to get the income tax. And that's going to be this number here. And it's also like calculated as a percentage oftentimes when you look at types of problems. And then we're going to have the uh, net income being the 124.50 minus the 48.180 income tax, giving us the 72.270, same number here. So we have the same number at the end of the day, if we were to, com to compare this to the normal income statement, so here's the income statement, here's the contribution margin, 
the thing to note here is that we're coming out with the same number. We're coming out with the 72, 270, 72, 270, bottom line's the same. The breakout is what's different. What's different about it? Over here, we're concerned about the categories. The most important number is the relationship between revenue and the cost of those revenues. But the cost of those revenues used some estimates because we had to, to allocate both variable and fixed portions to uh, get that number. So that's where the gross profit is. And then we had the categories of selling and administrative expenses. So we're grouping by those categories and we're making uh, decisions and looking at things in terms of that format. Over here, we're grouping by behavior. So we have the variable costs and the fixed costs broken out. That's going to be the grouping. Variable costs and fixed costs within there will have things all over the place. It's got stuff that's from the production of inventory. It's got stuff from the selling and the administrative area. The reason we're going to do that for internal purposes, and remember this is for internal purposes, not for the external financials generally, is that it's going to help us with projections. If we start to assume that we're going to produce more or less, we know that everything up here is going to change at a, at a fixed, uh, at a standard rate. It's going to change at a standard rate. And we know that everything down here to a certain level is not going to change at all. It doesn't matter how much stuff we, we produce. And that makes it a lot easier for us to start making projections. So if we take a look at, that, at, for example, the contribution margin per unit, we would have the sales per unit. So the sales per unit being this 285. And then we would have the variable cost per unit. So the variable cost per unit, if we pull out the calculator here, we're going to say the variable cost per unit are going to be the uh, direct materials, which is the 247,950 divided by the number of units, in this case, the units produced up here, which is the 4350, we're going to get the 57. So we got the variable cost per unit for direct uh, labor, 57. And then if we're going to have the variable cost per unit for the direct, uh, I'm sorry, the direct materials was 57. If we take the direct wages, we take the 387,150 divided by the 4350. And we get the 89, so we've got 89. And then we've got the last one. Last one's a little tricky. It'd be the sales commission. And again, the sales commission's up here. That's something not normally we group together. We're not used to seeing those together when we think about the uh, normal financial statements because one's in cost gets sold and one is in sales, but they act the same way. So we're going to take the 95.7 divided by the 4350, and that's the 22. All right, so then if we have these added up, that's going to be the total variable costs. And then if we take the costs of the sales price minus the variable costs, we come up with the contribution margin uh, per unit. And the reason that's really important to be thinking about for anybody, I mean, even if it's like a hot dog stand to a large business, it's the idea is, well, how much does it cost per unit? How much am I getting per unit? I'm selling uh, at a cost of 285 minus the variable portion. That means we're walking away with 117 after variable costs, things that change with the unit sales, then you're going to ask, well, how many units do I have to sell in order to uh, break even? So the break even here, you'd have to cover the fixed costs. Fixed costs being 388500 divided by the 117, and that would give us, the, the we would have in this case, 3,320. The contribution margin percent is here. That's going to be this number, 7 over the 285, and that's going to be the 41. Of course, it's rounded upwards. 